Jeff, are you prepared? Well, first, let's take a moment. This is the first time we are recording with Whoa. video. We are trying to be more professional. We are. You have the actual BYU background thing. I have the sweet 90s look because my office situation is in flux, which you just moved from your like upstairs covey into like an actual room, right? Yeah. And so uh, I'm going to be doing the same here soon. And uh, But we are recording on video. Going to try putting this on the YouTubes. Ooh. Uh, maybe. Shout out shout out to our guy Dusty Litster. If you Dusty, Dusty if Litster, not, who you, who you learned has two T's in his name. Dusty Litster, not Lister. Dusty, part of the Rewind Network. Really excited about the Rewind Network. It obviously, it, for those of you who are are local, you know about Dusty and his high school coverage. Well, the Rewind Network is getting bigger from here on out, and it's about more than just high school coverage. We're part of it. We're excited about it. That's where our video is going to be. KSLsports.com. Going to be awesome. You're going to be able to, to see us there as well. Oh, uh, that's officially official. We're announcing Yeah, it. I forgot to tell you. Oh, yeah. Cool. So that's happening. So breaking news for everybody, including Garrett, right here in real time. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I knew that we had to, we had discussed it, but I did not know we had... Well, yeah. I gave the go ahead. So you did. It was fun. You did. You gave me the yeah. I'm on board with that, and then I guess I just ran with it from that point on. So really exciting stuff. There will be a lot more details on that as we, as it gets bigger and as we grow. And I'll probably write a newsletter on what that means for us um, and what that means for you guys, the listeners. But in the meantime, it's exciting. So today's kind of the trial run. Maybe it won't look good. I'm sure we're going to do things differently. Um, you know, it won't always just be a zoom meeting. We'll learn, we'll get better. Remember our first episode, Garrett, we oh sounded terrible. We, we didn't dude, know we I was doing. standing in my closet. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have actual microphones. We've, we've come a long way. It, it really has come a long way. And, and so the same way we did with the audio, we'll get better with the video as we go, but we're going to have dusty and his vast knowledge and vast amount of resources to help us get better faster. So it'll be good. I'm excited about it. I'm excited too. And just nothing preliminarily, obviously nothing will change. It's really just distribution, right? Like it's, we're going to be putting our videos on the Rewind YouTube channel. Things will be posted on, those will be posted on kslsports.com. Um, and, you know, everywhere where Rewind is just trying to get the, get the love out. You know, we yeah. were trying to recruit more hellions is what we're trying to do. That's really what we're trying to do. And look, let's be honest with ourselves. We're also trying to make a little bit more money as we do this. It's a discount show. We've upgraded. We're getting we better. Upgrade. And this yes. will help us upgrade a little bit more quickly. So yes, it will be, you know, the, the times when my wife is annoyed that we go in and it sometimes takes us two and a half, three hours to record a show because we get distracted. You and I start talking about other stuff. We pull random ideas out of our butt that never end up going anywhere, but we have to come up with an entire business plan of the random idea and then never actually do with anything with it. We, we have that. binders full of ideas, binders got, full of ideas. If anybody needs ideas, we got them. We don't we know how plans. to execute those ideas. Some of them we do. Some of them we could execute really well, uh, but we definitely have ideas. We definitely have ideas, but Jeff, I am here to start tonight by boggling your mind with two things that I learned yesterday. I'm ready. Uh, one of these came from a book that I read, was reading to my kids, and the other was from a TikTok, of course, because where else do you get new, learn new things? Yeah, TikTok so, University is where it's at. Tic, TikTok you. Um, the first from the book, you know, when little kids, like two year olds, three-year-olds when they are walking how like they kind of put their arms out and mm -hmm. to like balance themselves and when they it's not like a normal walk it's kind of, it's like a weird like kind of pitter-patter walk yeah did you know there is a verb for that of what they are doing no it is i assume waddle but it is toddle with a t oh and, my and that's why they're called toddlers Whoa. And that word, that word predates the word toddler because then we looked it up last time because in the book I was reading, it was like, a, did your kids ever watch Daniel Tiger? Uh -huh. It was a Daniel Tiger book and it was like, Margaret toddled to her mom and it was like toddled. What? And I looked it up and it's like, that's what they used to say, describe how little kids walked. It was like little kids toddled around and then hmm. they became toddlers. But then we stopped saying toddle. That blew my mind. That is the, crazy. The other thing 
Okay. So when you were growing up or you hear whatever, if you hear the phrase backpacking through Europe or backpacking yeah. across Europe, what yeah. does that mean to you? Uh, I guess that is, I have always kind of assumed it's like a hike. Like I go backpacking in the U.S. That's what I thought. But of course, Nick, as I say this and I'm explaining it, that's one hell of a backpacking trip if you're backpacking through Europe. So clearly it can't mean that. I mean, I guess maybe you're not. I just assumed like you're going through part of Europe because you're obviously not clearly going to go across the entire thing from like Moscow to Lisbon, right? right. But right. the so backpacking through Europe, it just means you're traveling light. That's it's like stupid. you're only taking enough stuff with you to fit into a backpack. That's but dumb. you're not like, and if this was this big thing in the, the comment section on this TikTok. We're like going through like people arguing about it of this like big regulation of the people meant like backpacking just meant, yes, in Europe, when they say backpacking, that means traveling, just traveling, like you're, you took the spirit flight that charged extra for baggage. So you stuck an extra pair of underwear in your backpack and went. That's, that's what that, stupid. That's what backpacking means. That's and a stupid is, word. Europe is stupid with their words. It, Europe is stupid. What does uh, Ron Swanson say in that in Parks and Rec when he's going to uh, when he goes and gets his haircut from Donna's friend? Oh, and he's like the, <laughs> the typhoon. He's like, oh, the Euro trash, and he starts giggling. He's like, mm, Euro trash. <laughs> yeah, I like that's, that. that's how I feel. Euro trash. Yeah, that's how um, I feel. But those uh, are my I, two mind-boggling things that I, I got learned. one. I got one, okay. and it, I really just remembered it as you were talking about TikTok. Have you heard of Bob Tick? No, you haven't seen this yet. There's some cat named Bob Tick is what they're calling him. I don't know if that's like his username. I don't, I don't know where it comes from. But Bob Tick is apparently copywriting just all of the sounds on TikTok. So whether you are the original creator of this sound or not, like you use a How sound, it, it goes viral. Well, if I am the creator and I don't copyright it, oh, that's... all he's got to do is download it get a copyright say, Hey, yeah, I have the sound people are using it. So like, if you ever noticed on TikTok, there will be like trends, right. That like right. everybody does. And then like six weeks later, all of a sudden that sound will be removed. It's because somebody retroactively filed a copyright claim. And apparently this Bob tick dude, that's like how he's making money is he's just going and taking all of these viral sounds that he has nothing to do with and claiming them as his own and because TikTok's rules, like their governance board, maybe I'm wrong on all of this, but this is what the TikTok said. The TikTok governance board doesn't follow the same protocol that we do here in the United States, right? So the copyright rules are just, they don't really apply. Right. And so TikTok just says, there's a copyright and it's not yours. Sorry, your claim. And they deny all these claims. They deny like the the uh, the appeals, I guess. And so this Bob Tick guy is just collecting all of the, the TikTok revenue when sounds go viral because he is copywriting these sounds after they go viral. That is bizarre to me because I feel like I get obviously you have to file the copyright, but I feel like if you did not produce it, you should not be able to go out and copyright it. It's just like it is whatever it's called, like under the general public use license, like how you there's like, so. you know, like those old books where it's like, oh, the copyright came back off this book. So now you can get the audiobook on LibriVox because no one's trying to sell copies right. of books from the 1850s. Right. Like, but it's, hey, I would just, I would just think it's like, you can't copyright it if it's yours. And if you choose not to copyright it, then it's fair game for everybody. But, yeah, I agree. And it feels like if I'm filing a copyright, I can't use the name Bob Tick. I've got to have like a real name. And I don't know. So there's some holes in the theory, but there were multiple videos that I saw of guys who allegedly had been the victims of Bob Tick. So I don't know. We'll see. Uh, speaking of victims, our beloved horned frogs. Man. Oh gosh, dude, they Holy. did. They did not get horny. No, they. That was bad. Uh, but here's the thing. Everybody said that because they lost by 58. Obviously, they didn't belong. Uh, they didn't play well. Georgia played exceptionally well. I don't think anybody's coming within 30 points of Georgia on, on Monday night. They still beat Michigan. They still went 13-2. and two. Like, to say that they don't belong because of a blowout, like, we've seen Super Bowls that were blowouts, right? Like, remember, 
uh, it was the Denver Broncos and the Carolina Panthers and mm-hmm. the, the one that Peyton won when he was in Denver, right? Like that game right. wasn't even close. And nobody was like, well, clearly Carolina didn't belong. <laughs> like sometimes it just happens and it sucks. TCU, I don't think was the number two team in the, in the country, but they earned their spot. And it made my heart sad <laughs> when people yeah. were like, well, they, they've got blown out. So clearly they don't belong. That was dumb. Which is, is stupid. And that's even the, the word that they've said all along with the 12 team playoff. And even with the end with March madness, it's, they don't, they care about making money. And the, the way that they kind of frame all of it is they just talk about it's like it's access or participation. Yeah. Even with yeah. the FCS playoff, they they expanded it all the way. It's at 24 teams now, which I think is ridiculous. I think right. 12 is the perfect number, but it's like it's at 24 teams now, which you need. And if you expand beyond 12, then they're going to end up going back to, I mean, what do you go back to 11 regular season games, yeah, which so that you're not putting that back in the box. Um, So it's like, it's still like, yeah, there's all this thing, but you still end up with like two top five teams playing in the FCS title game every year. It's just the way it is, but there is the chance of a Cinderella, right? Like there's, that's what it is. It's access. There's the it's, chance of there's somehow Butler can go to the final four twice. Right. Yeah. Somehow you, you M case. What is it? UMBC can knock off Virginia. Right. And, and, and that's, that's what it's all about, right? Like how many years did we go in the NBA until Golden State in whatever 2006 as an eight seed upset the number one seed Dallas Mavericks, I think is who it was. Yeah, I mean, that was the first time it had ever happened. And it had been, you know, the NBA had existed for like 45 years in the structure that we know the NBA to exist. And I don't know that it's happened since maybe once. Nobody's ever said, well, well, you shouldn't have an eight seed. I mean, I have because the playoffs are extraordinarily long in the NBA. But it's access. It's that chance. And TCU had a chance. They got beat. Look, like there were conference championships, right, they, th- that were blowouts. You don't say that the one side didn't deserve to play. Uh, yeah. U- USC. USC got torched by Utah. And they had already lost to Utah. But nobody's like, well, USC didn't belong in the Pac-12 championship game because they got blown yeah. out. Like, no, they, they got blown out. That's what it was. TCU yeah, got he- blown out. Even like looking at the NBA, right? It's supposed to be more parody because it's, you know, a professional sport. You don't have recruiting the same way, blah, 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 blah. Like the, uh, there are 13 NBA franchises that have never won a title. And yeah. there's like Lakers and Celtics have both won 17. Golden State has won seven. The Bulls won their six with Jordan. Never one of them with anybody else. The Spurs have won five. All their most recent was 1999. And then yeah, no like, other team has won more than three. Parody like is that's, a myth. It's a myth. Yeah, parody is a myth. It, it It is what it is. And I don't... So I'm excited for that. I mean, I'm excited. It was fun that they got there. The, the story... I mean, I wrote about it on Monday before the game. Like, it was extremely unlikely. And just as unlikely as... TCU pulling off the upset was the result that we got. And I think that's something that people need to keep in mind too, of like how you frame it is that if they played this game 10 times, TCU would probably win one, maybe two where things would go their way. But also there's only one, maybe two where it was a blowout of this proportion, right? Like most of the, the most, if they played this game 10 times, most of the scores are probably like 42 to 10 or like, 42 to 17 something well, that I is mean, not how many not how many, a tenfold difference how many simulations does uh you know a, a vegas sports book run in order to come up with a line that's going to represent hey a we're going to get on both and it was sides. still 13 and a half and right it was 13 and a half right i mean that's a big score for a national championship but like it's not 58 points or whatever it was right, right. so i don't know it's tough but tcu they fell that sucks but now, and, now um, that the season's over, their offensive coordinator is going to Clemson. I don't know gone. if you saw that. He, yeah, yeah. He, Garrett Riley. That's tough. He, they just saw his plane landed in in Clemson. Yeah, uh, and he Garrett Riley is gone, so they're gonna have to. Which I mean, Garrett Riley's there. Obviously, Sonny Dykes is an offensive guy, so it's there won't. I don't know how much of a drop off it there will be, but I think the biggest thing about is it in terms of call it as we kind of shift into the off season now and kind of. We don't have BYU games to talk about, so we can talk about the sport as a whole. The is that this is a a big 
change for Clemson because Clemson's problem has always been they promoted internally. Everyone was always Dabo guys. Dabo was never a play caller himself. He didn't, ha- he never had his own system because he's, you know, the raw, raw wide receivers coach is out there saying they built their program on the name, image, and likeness of God. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was just that there's like a, are there people there that have had the mentorship around right. them because they right. were very young. It was in a lot of ways, it was like the 2017 BYU staff where it's like, yeah, you played, you know, you maybe coached a little bit here and there, but it's like, you yep. haven't been around the block for the decades that even, you know, that someone who's been in the profession forever has. And so this is a big shift for Clemson in that probably, and this is, this is a big move and it's probably the kind of move that Jimbo Fisher should have made instead of going out and hiring freaking Bobby Petrino. Yeah. My favorite uh, tweet that I saw about the move was, I wonder how Garrett Riley is going to feel transitioning from a secular school in Texas Christian university and playing at a Christian <laughs> school at Clemson. That is hilarious. <laughs> that was funny. That was funny. But TCU, that's a big hit for them, right? I mean, they lose a lot of talent. They lose the national championship, and now they lose their offensive coordinator. That's a big hit. And this is a good parlay into our next segment. Our guy, Mitch Harper, did his way-too-early power rankings of the new Big 12. The Big 12 for 2024. Not the Big 12, excuse me, 2023. Not the, the long-term new Big 12. But the Big 12 for next year still includes Texas and Oklahoma. Now, I want to run through these rankings, and I want to to get your thoughts. I have a lot of thoughts. Okay. I'm here for these. Number one, he's got Texas. The top team at this point in the offseason, Texas. Weird, Hmm. but I think you can wrap your head around it. Arch Manning's coming in. Quinn Ewers is still there. Maybe Sark finally gets it turned around. But like, hey, eight and five Sark was eight and five a whole lot at Washington. Uh, looks like he's going to be eight and five again at Texas. Yeah. But it's with Texas. It's the thing is they have the talent that it's like if it clicks they can roll right. Yeah. It's yeah. it's never it's never been about the talent and that is, I mean that's that's obviously the big the big going thing. So with I mean, I don't know. I'd put him number one though, because it's like they have the talent, but they don't have the team. That yeah, I, and, I agree. And, it, and it's I don't know if they'll be able to do that. And it's I mean, Quinn Ewers like was fine, but he went from being the hot shot, like oh, we would have beat Bama if we had Quinn Ewers, and he wouldn't have gotten hurt. To like Texas fans were like, oh, he's not the answer already for Arch. And honestly, right. I don't know. Well, I was never really sold on Quinn Ewers, mostly because like he got hurt a lot in high school, so it was like all of the hype was built off of his sophomore year. And then you look at him and you're like, uh, he seems a little Tate Martelli where it's like, he's into the idea of being a hotshot player and not like the grind of the game, but maybe he's not, I don't know, but it's like arch. I mean, he played at a two A school in new Orleans. It's the same one as uncles played at. So it's, you know, you can't really like blame that, but it's not, wasn't exactly tough competition. If you've ever watched his huddle film, it's like that. And his yeah. numbers weren't that great. And so it's, he definitely is pushed up because of his name and what they think he can become because his he's a Manning, but I don't know. I I don't see it with Texas. I would put him like maybe third. Yeah, I, I would too. I don't think Texas is one, but I can at least understand the logic, right? Because they yeah. do have the talent. So again, we love Mitch. Mitch is our guy. Number two, by the logic that led to Texas being number one, I think you'd expect Oklahoma to be number two. Oklahoma's not number two. It's TCU. He's got TCU as Mm. number two, which I get, but I don't know that TCU is going to be able to capture the magic that was this year. I mean, people forget that Max Duggan was a backup. He wasn't supposed to be playing, right? I mean, this year was a pretty wild year. Um, I mean, how many games came down to the wire? They had the game against Baylor that like literally the wire, right? Like a last second running clock field goal to win the game. That that 13 and two season was really close to being like nine and five, you know, like which, it, it which most gone. are most are. So I don't know that I'd put TCU that high, but that's where Mitch has got him. Uh, TCU at number two. OK, well, Texas is number one. TCU is just the national championship. We could wrap our heads around that. They should clearly uh, be up at the top. So Oklahoma should be three, right? Yeah, no. I would assume. Um, you know, TCU. 
the thing with TCU is I don't even know how many they lose because like is Duggan could come back, but is he? That's I, the question. Like Quentin Johnson, he probably not coming back. That uh, Demarcado kid, the running back. They're two run though, and then the other they're running both backs running backs. Yep. yep, both running backs are. I think Johnny Hodges, my linebacker paramore, is a. I don't. He's a senior because uh, he dipped out of the Naval Academy, so I think he maybe have one year. So it's they lose a lot. Like this was yeah. this was their year where they the the quarterback situation hit. Who knows what what's his face Morris would have done had he stayed healthy, um, but it's like the quarterback situation hit and all the pieces fell into place and the the ball needed to bounce their way. They were never dominant the way Georgia was, like you said. And so I, it's like they're not. That's they're going to regress to the mean next year. I, I think so too. I think so too. Um, so clearly Oklahoma should be number three, right? If Texas is number one, they're not. I mean, Kansas. This State. is this is where yeah I think Kansas State. They Kansas State's yeah, gonna they're, be they're losing too. Adrian Martinez, but they benched him. They, they benched Adrian Martinez, but they lose uh Deuce Vaughn. And that mm, was so how many much of their offensive of their offense. Yeah, how many offensive linemen do they have coming back though? That's what that's a good question. I need I to look know. at because because you can you can plug in you can plug in a running back if you know, assuming if the talent is I don't there. know though. Deuce Deuce Vaughn was pretty special. He he was, and he was their offense. But I mean, if you look, it's like the quarterback, what's this? I don't remember the kid's name that came in for Martinez when they really started playing well down the stretch. If he can keep, if he can take a step forward and then, you know, then, and uh, in his passing game, especially then, you know, maybe he can take a little pressure off for the new guy. So it's Kansas is where I would expect because I don't, off the top of my head, they are going to be returning more guys than TCU is. So I would expect them to come closer. But then again, we saw Baylor return a whole bunch of people and, and not sucked. do it. Yeah. Okay. Number four. Now is where you see Oklahoma, right? It has to be Oklahoma. Texas Tech. Tech. Hey, I love me some Joey McGuire, but that's a bold I mean, claim right there. Texas Tech. Joey McGuire is awesome. I, I think he is the right yeah. guy to be the head coach. But like, even the, though Dylan Gabriel struggled at, at, at Oklahoma this year, he wasn't what what everybody hoped he would be coming from UCF. I have a really hard time putting Tyler Schuff in front of Dylan Gabriel in any ranking ever of any kind. Yeah, that and I mean, I do me. agree with where Mitch said he said Tyler Schuff is returning, which means the Red Raiders could be a trendy top twenty five team, kind of similar how. Uh, like how North Carolina was heading into the yeah. 2021 season where it's like, Oh, they did. They looked better than they should be in 2020. They're going to do it this year. And then eh, they kind of fell yeah, apart, but it is something that I think it was the first time ever that tech beat Texas and Oklahoma in the same season. Yeah. So, or like I think the second tech time is ever. on the so right direction. They're going in the right direction. I was surprised to see them at number four in the power rankings. Clearly then number five has to be Oklahoma. No power rankings of the Big 12 that includes Texas up at the top could possibly keep Oklahoma out of the top five. He's got Baylor at number five. Dude, Mitchell, do we need to do we need to text him and put him on the spot right here? Say, Mitchell, accept the Zoom invite right now. You need to explain yourself. It's it's an interesting claim, man. I mean, Baylor, I don't know what Baylor showed this year that would give Dude, anybody any confidence in Baylor next year. The I mean, I Blake, they put all of their eggs, and everyone was so hyped that uh, that Gary Bohannon was not it. Yeah, and Tebow Blake, was not the problem, man. And, and Blake Shapin, like Bohannon, like they were limping with Blake Shapin or Bohannon, but then, you know, Shapin was going to be the guy and do so great, blah, 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 blah. And then it just like was not, it did not work at any no. level. And then they had a quarterback flip on signing day. And then it's like, I think they just got like an FCS transfer or somebody else signed finally, but they it's, it's a mess. And well, they, and the, their inability to run the ball. Right. Was, Shocking. Well, I, mean, I mean, they did, they ran the ball fine, but it was but like, not what they should the way, not what they should have given the fact that they had like their entire offensive line returning. Look, when you have, <laughs> I mean, what did they run for? I don't know. I don't have, I don't want to pull up the box score, but they couldn't run the ball. They ran the if ball you, something like you, 55 times. And if you they can't average run like 2.9 yards a carry, yeah. they, if you we can't literally, run the ball after BYU, that game, we thought that we are defensive woes of 2021 were gone right. because there's yeah. no possible way that we could go against that Baylor offensive line that was returning the big 12 champs with four returning starters coached by Jeff Grimes could not like, of course, they're going to be able to run the ball all over us. 
then it was like, oh, well, shoot. Okay, I guess we got a good defense yeah, now. You, they, and then we played the rest of the season. <laughs> right. So there, there's some problems there. And it, it, I think you listen to Baylor fans talk about the offensive side of the ball. Those complaints sound really familiar, right? It's the complaints that BYU fans had about a Jeff Grimes offense, that it gets really run heavy. It's not very innovative. And uh, sometimes they get stuck in there. No, we're going to um, run the ball. We're going to run the ball. Did you so BYU finished the season? We finished the season 10th in yards per rush on offense at 5.3. Baylor was 59th, tied with uh UTEP at 4.3. Ah. So we averaged a full yard per carry more well, than them, which maybe is it's not so bad. And it, it, it's going to be interesting, right? So here's the here's the irony in looking at Baylor and BYU for me is that BYU fans have lamented the play of the BYU offensive line all year long. Right. Like it has been right, wrong, fair, unfair. It has been the subject of so much scrutiny from BYU fans. Baylor is looking to a pair of BYU offensive linemen to fix their offensive line. So this this BYU offensive line that was so full of woes and so full of 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 poor play. Baylor is looking to those players to say, hey, please fix what we've got. And yet, if you asked any random BYU fan off the street, nine out of 10 of them would tell you that they would prefer to have Jeff Grimes come back. And maybe that's the but, right call, but there's some irony there. There, There is some irony, and people say like, oh, well, it's just because they're using Grimes as players, which we talked about this. They're not using Grimes as players. They're like, well, they're using guys that were coached by Grimes. And right. maybe, maybe... Shout out Mike Empey. Yeah, shout out Mike Empey for getting the guys that got this all started and shout out for Grimes for getting them ready to play. Shout out to Funk for keeping it rolling. Now we'll see as, I mean, Kingsley never played under Grimes. Like now we'll see this year how they play with new things. But also uh, pass protection wise, we gave up also 10th, one sack a game tied for 10th and Baylor. Uh, let's see. He was tied for 44th tied with SMU, Ohio and West Virginia at 1.7 sacks a game. So that is uh Let's see. That is how you say seventy percent more sacks yeah. th- per game, if you want to phrase it that way. And oh my goodness, Colorado State five point two sacks per game. That's brutal, dude. Their uh, poor quarterback. How, why would Dallin Holker want to go there? They're never going to be able to throw the ball to him. Hey, they want uh, time. I would be very. Or maybe that's why it'll all be those. It'll be quick passes to the tight end because they will not have time to do anything I- else. I would be willing to bet a significant sum of money that our guy Jackson Brousseau is the quarterback for uh, Colorado State on day one. I mean, so you, that's my guess. They don't. They ain't got anybody else. They don't so. got anybody else. Yeah. Number six, finally Oklahoma. Brett Venables, man, like is it learning pains? Like their team was decimated after Luke uh, Lincoln Riley left. So is it is it growing pains? And Venables is going to turn it around this year. Oklahoma went six and seven like they finished below 500 that doesn't happen in norman i don't actually when was the last time that happened i I mean it's it's been it's had decades is is my guess let me see i can tell you this answer in about two seconds um keep talking so it doesn't happen very often i'm really curious to see who oklahoma is next year because they are bringing back dylan gabriel uh brett venables has to get things going in a hurry they have the talent. They're still Oklahoma. They'll always have the talent. So they've got the pieces to turn it around really quickly. Uh, but it is pretty interesting. I mean, a 6-7 and seven OU team, and they didn't look particularly good at any point in the year. Yeah, they have not. Um, the last time they had a losing season was, ni- oh, I guess, 1998. They went yeah, six so and five 20, in ninety. Oh shoot! They had six and uh, five is not a losing season, though, my friend. Or no, five and six. Sorry, ah. I was looking at the last column first. So they had from ninety five, ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight. They had three straight losing seasons. Okay, and, so twenty five years ago. Yep, and then before that, it was nineteen sixty five. It just doesn't happen. So pretty crappy year. Uh, number seven in Mitch's power rankings, starting to breeze through this a little bit. Uh, Kansas which I think is that's about where I would probably have them. Jalen Daniels comes back. I don't know. Like did Kansas catch lightning in a bottle at the beginning of the year and ride some momentum. Uh, obviously Jalen Daniels was injured. And when he came back, it was different, but like they weren't great. 
to end the year, but they were really great by Kansas standards. So is this like the start of the beginning of the new Kansas or did they revert back to the Kansas that we know and they had just kind of got lucky at the beginning of the year? I don't know, but seven feels about right. I think. Yeah. The, I still, I don't know. I just don't, I mean, I get the, the thing with Kansas is it's, you have Lance Leipold and that it's like, he can coach. He's coached at multiple levels. He's done it in weird places that are hard to succeed. And like, if you don't know Lance Leipold's story, then that is like, go look it up. He is yeah. insane amount of success at lower levels. And then kind of Buffalo was like, well, we're not pulling a random big 10 assistant, you know, position coach to be a Mac coach is not really working for us. Let's try something else and it worked. They, but I just don't know. I think they're still another couple of years away. Cause they just don't have the talent there. Cause even this year, it's like their recruiting class. They finished ranked lowest they're the worst recruiting class in the big 12 this year 10 out of 10 and so they they have some they got some work to do they I do think, going forward uh number eight the first newcomer mitch has ucf at number eight and i like that ucf has they've recruited well they they i mean they got gus bus right gus bell's on he knows how to win at a high level the sec is a tough place for anybody to win and he's done it at the highest levels he couldn't do it with the consistency of a nick saban or whatever and that's you know if you're not living up to nick saban that's enough to get you fired from auburn but he is going good to enough. be their quarterback in the next year is john reese Plumley coming back because mikey keen the kid who started before he transferred to fresno Right. The kid who came in for after when Dylan Gabriel got hurt and then was benched. So is John Reese Plumbing coming back or they got somebody else in there? Uh they're gonna have to figure that out, right? I think either way they're having a, a quarterback battle. Right. But they've got a lot of defense coming back. And that's that's mm-hmm. one of the big things is that, that that defense should be really good. They've got the athletes. They've got the athletes to compete in the Big Twelve right away. Very um, very similar to TCU. And it's just very like similar. They, they, they play they can play a speed game. Yeah. Uh, number nine here in Mitch's rankings. Maybe Oklahoma, too high. Maybe too Oklahoma high. Oklahoma State me. is too high given Oklahoma State. what they've what they've had. It's yeah. uh it, it's and especially now it's like Derek Mason, their offensive coordinator. He just quit after one De- season. Defensive coordinator, yeah. The he steps out. Yeah, that's what I meant. Um, they, they've got a mess to figure out there. So they've been decimated by the transfer portal. They've yeah, they've had more, just about as many as everyone else. So I think there's a lot of issues in that locker room, and Gundy is on the hot seat. And it's his, his magic run of turning Oklahoma State into a contender. Because, I mean, Oklahoma State was not – right. they were not that good before um, – before Not the, consistently, right? I mean, no, they had like, blips, I think but they – They had um, – so even – so the – they only won had like th- three 10 win seasons before 2010. And yeah, I no. think two of them were when Mike Gundy was their starting quarterback. <laughs> and then he took over in 2005 and they went like four and seven, seven and six. So it's really like the run of Oklahoma state being a really good team that is very consistent and cranking out 10 win seasons. Like that is a very new thing. Like Oklahoma state, is kind of they mirror Stanford a lot of ways in that regard, not obviously academically, but like how it was. Yeah, like Stanford had a couple of good seasons with John Elway, and then they really sucked in before and at you know up until Harbaugh got there, and then Shaw kept it rolling. And it's in a lot of ways, Gunny is the Mike Shaw of Oklahoma State, and I don't know that they are going to keep that going because it seems like the wheels are completely falling off. Yeah, it sure feels like it. Uh, number ten, Cincinnati. Another another. I don't know, a head scratcher a little bit. Cincinnati's got the talent, but this ain't Luke Fickle Cincinnati anymore. And I don't, I don't, I don't know, know that what I trust I... Scott Satterfield. Yeah, like he he was always kind of flirting with other schools. So the fit at Louisville was always weird. But like, I don't know that I trust him either. And so that's that's an interesting one. Cincinnati had that run. And I think that they have built a lot of name recognition off of Luke Fickle, Desmond Ritter, and that run over the last couple of years. But they weren't the same Cincinnati this year. They were still a, a very good team in the AAC, but they weren't anywhere near the levels that they had been at. And that was with Luke Fickle. I don't see them being able to, to contend. I mean, people forget. BYU fans, we forget. 
it was just a few years ago that BYU played, had a home and home with Cincinnati. They got the best of Cincinnati in Provo and in Cincinnati. So this isn't some powerhouse program. I was a little bit surprised to see them at number 10. Uh, number 11, and this feels right, Iowa State. They really struggled. They were not good. Really, they were four they and eight not, this year. They were not good, and they fired their offensive coordinator, but then they promoted their run game coordinator to yeah, be that, that, was weird. that ain't like you you're gonna do the same system that wasn't working. Like, I mean, and it if you thought that he was gonna be the guy, then why didn't you give him play calling duties and make him the de facto offensive coordinator and let him have a trial run the last three weeks of the season? Because like what is he going to do that's drastically different? So it that's a weird that is a weird hire. It doesn't seem like it. It kind of feels like Matt Campbell. If they lost, they had their lightning in the bottle. They got Brock Purdy. Right? Well, when you have Brock was, Purdy and Brees Hall, man, I mean, right. you're like going to win a lot of games no matter he captured, what He captured his, you know, th- those were your guys. And then now that they're gone, they've not been replaced. And, you know, a lot of coaches, what I've noticed is a lot of coaches are good with one quarterback. And then yeah. they cannot get a second one. And then yeah. they miss their window. Like the uh, the number of coaches that consistently like crank good quarterback talent there's not many very very, there's it's very very small they're they're named lincoln riley lincoln riley robert and i and jason beck aaron aaron roderick aaron roderick and then whoever you're getting at bama but like even you know and then i don't even know or that's a that even at bama right right? like Like, bama's the amount of talent you well, and Bama's, like, Bama's a revolving door at offensive coordinator. It's right. not the same offensive coordinator who's producing, you know, Jalen Hurts to Tua to it's Mac true. Jones. It, it, they're they're going through coordinators every year. That's right. Nick but Saban it, in Alabama. Right. But at these smaller school, like at the oh, schools yeah. that don't have the history where it's like you strike once, even like look at guys like Seth Luttrell. If you yeah. remember him at North Texas, he had Mason Fine. It was like, oh man, he's a quarterback guru. He came over to North Texas. He took this kid who's like 5'10 from this no name school in Oklahoma, was his only offer. He identified him, made him great, blah, 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 blah. They won back to back conference championships, could never get good quarterback play again, and got fired this year. Yeah. Although they did have halfway decent. I mean, that Asanani kid, well, not kid, he's a man. He's like our age, is, is pretty good, but it's really hard to consist get consistent quarterback identification and it's development. And, and and Iowa State, frankly, they got lucky with Brock Purdy, not in the sense that he turned into who Brock Purdy turned into. That that takes talent and development and luck. But they got lucky to get Brock Purdy at all. Like people forget the story of Brock Purdy. Uh he didn't sign in the early signing period. Uh he had committed to Iowa State, really didn't have any other offers. And then he blew up. I mean he started to pick up big time offers and stuck with Iowa State, so they kind of got lucky yeah. to even to even get him yeah, in the first. He place. visited his official visits were UCF, Boise, uh, Iowa State, and then went to Bama and then A and M. Yeah, I mean, A and M was his final visit leading into final. And, and, and he he blew up late, and that was a great recruiting win. Uh, but had he blown up before the early signing period, Purdy probably never goes to Iowa State, and we never really talk about him. Right, uh, number twelve. BYU. He's got Mitch has got BYU all the way at number 12. And now here's the thing. Maybe I'm a BYU homer. Of course I'm a BYU homer. I think BYU is going to do, I think the schedule depends like the schedule is going to make or break BYU season. Right. Right. But assuming that BYU does not play all of Baylor, TCU, Oklahoma, Texas, Texas tech, you know, all of the top six or seven teams, assuming that's sort of spread out, I think with Keaton Slovis coming back, I think with the offensive line coming back, I I, I don't like the offensive line. Man, they lose keep, a lot, but I, I just I don't see them behind BYU. Iowa State. Like, yeah, yeah, you, you're losing Jaron Hall, but it's like I don't care that we're losing Jaron Hall. We're bringing in Keaton Slovis. I, and I'm not. I'm not expecting. Who does, who does BYU, Iowa State have? I'm not expecting BYU to win eight or nine games by any stretch of the imagination, but I think there's a pretty reasonable argument to be made that they could. Now I think BYU probably finishes at, you know, six and six, seven and five, but I, I don't think that it would be incredibly surprising if they were eight and four or nine and three. I don't think they will, but I th- you look at the head to head matchups, you look at who's coming back. It's January. We've got it a depends. long time. And I think BYU, there's an argument to be made that they could. Right. right? 
I don't think anybody's going to feel crazy to say, okay, BYU plays uh, Sam Houston. They play an FCS team. So let's, and then at Arkansas. So let's say two and one of the preseason. And then if BYU gets a schedule and they end up playing, you know, Houston, West Virginia, well, Iowa yeah, State. They, they play Sam Houston, who's in their first year of SBS, FCS. So it's like an FCS and a half. Right. And, and, but uh, even if the Big 12 schedule comes out in the next week or two and BYU plays, you know, Oklahoma State, Cincinnati, Kansas, Kansas State, OU, you know, and then Houston or or, or West Virginia, right? And that makes right. up your six or seven main games. Is that really that crazy to say, oh, yeah, if that's the slate, BYU could easily split that. I think a lot of BYU fans are overvaluing how difficult it will be. It will be difficult, but I think BYU fans are looking at Utah and what Utah went through and saying, well, yeah, it's going to be hard because Utah went to the Pac-12 and it was hard. I don't think that's fair. It's a different comparison, or it's a different, yeah, comparison because BYU is joining the Big 12 and there isn't a USC that you're going to have to overcome, right? Texas is gone. OU is gone. Not next year, but they're gone. Right. And they're coming in with three teams that historically BYU has had success against, right? They've beaten Houston recently, multiple times. They have beaten Cincinnati recently, multiple times. They've split a series with UCF and most recently beat UCF handily. Actually, That's, well, no, we, yeah, split a series. Oh, yeah, because there was the the game in like 2011. It was one of, I was on mission, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. And then so we have a we we have a winning record against against all, all of them, the, all three schools that are coming and, in. And so that's who BYU. I mean, conceivably they're going to play, you know, at least one or two of those three teams in, as part of their new schedule. So they have some built-in competition that's at the same level as them, assimilating into the Power Five world. That's something that Utah didn't have, right? Utah was, Utah, and we're not quite going the same like the way that the program is being run it is not it is not making the same jump that you independence like independence is not power five football but it's not mountain west football either yeah it was like we're not having to go zero to a hundred we're like going or zero to 60 we're going like 45 to 60 (laughs) so again i don't think the byu is going to go nine and three i'm certainly not going to predict that but I don't think I would get to you know an eight and four record at the end of the year and be like, holy cow, what a remarkable season. I think that we're we're overstating how maybe it's not overstating how difficult the Big 12 is, but understating how prepared BYU realistically is moving into where they're moving into. And I think it'll there's gonna be games that are close and a lot of it, it's gonna come down to right, like how how many of those you know of those losing games right where it's like plays bounce one way or the other and you like in in, in what i wrote on monday talking about it where it's like the average game comes down to like five or six plays and if you take out the blowouts from that sample you're really pulling it down it's like it's three or four plays or big plays are what are making the difference and so i think whether we go five and seven or eight and four those three wins or losses in the middle will be one score games. Yeah. And I so, think so, and if you are in a one score game, that means you were good enough to win the game, but you know, someone made a mistake. And really, if you're in a one score game, it really comes down to like one person made a mistake. Like you threw a pick and gave the other team the ball in field goal position already. And they kicked a field goal and you lost by three, you, yep. or you fumbled the ball or like you had a busted coverage and gave someone a cheap touchdown. And then you lost by four, but you should have actually won by three, whatever it's, it's like, so if you win, it, it'll be interesting to see how much. And that's really what I'm looking for of like, okay, how are we getting better is like one, how do we do as the season goes on? Cause I remember my sophomore year of high school, they built a new high school. So we like the, then that school only had freshmen and sophomores. So we had a JV team, but no varsity team. And then the next year we had a varsity team, but we only had juniors and we practiced, you know, whatever. And then I remember that first game, we lost like 60 to nothing. That first game going out the first game of the season, but I was shocked at how fast the other team was. And then by the third week of the season, it like it, it slowed down. And so it was like, there's, 
just the fact of going against that every and, and people are complaining this about basketball too. Like obviously the Big Twelve is a gauntlet; it's by far the best basketball conference in the country. But the eggs that we lay against WCC teams, like no matter who you are, you play to some extent to the level of the competition, and going against better competition makes you better. And so as as we how we do at the beginning versus the end of the season is what I want to care about. And then how many, like, are there one score games? Like if we have a losing record, but it's a bunch of one score games, I'm honestly like, I'm okay. I'm like, yes, it sucks. But it's like, we were in all those games. We could compete. And if we play that's those games again, we probably finished seven and five most of the time, but we ended yeah. up on the flip side of it. And, and the other thing about BYU that I, before we move on to number 13 here, uh, BYU is a better team than they showed this year because they had some terrible defensive coaching that changes next year. Right. I don't know the BYU. I mean, certainly they're not a a playoff contender this year, but they're better. They have more talent than they showed because of just terrible defensive coaching that goes away. Uh, Number 13, Houston, the final newcomer to the big 12 conference. And Mitch has got them at number 13. That's about right. I think. And Dana Holgerson, we're going to find out, um, what he's capable, like what he's built Houston into Clayton tune is gone. And so now he's got to find a quarterback. And we saw when he was at West Virginia, that when Dan, when Dana Holgerson has a quarterback, his offenses are fun and his teams are generally pretty good. But when he has some quarterback questions, he doesn't always get the right guy right away. So Houston, Houston could struggle a little bit going into next year. And then we just mentioned in West Virginia, that rounds out the rest of the conference, Power rankings, according to Mitch Harper, he's got the Mountaineers at number 14. I think that's fair. There's not a whole lot to, I, there's not a lot that I could argue that would say, nope, that's dead wrong. They should be higher. The only reason that they are not breaking in a new coach is because it is currently en vogue to fire your coach week three of the season instead of after the season. And they just got a new athlete and they just got a new athletic director. So instead of doing what Auburn did, where they, Got there, and I'm pretty sure the new athletic director at Auburn's interview was, "Will you fire Brian right. Harson?" Right. And that's the first, and he was like, "Yes, of course." Like, damn it, you're no, hired. You're but, our guy. But the so he, the only reason they hired a new athletic director, and then I think they basically are just going to sit. And West Virginia has money. Like, obviously, they got their couple big boosters. That I don't think that was an issue, but it was kind of like okay, let's do a full thing and maybe let's just go one more off season cycle, get the lay of the land. Maybe he turns it around. If he doesn't, then let me do some time building some relationships. So I'm not trying to convince someone to come to a job that I've only been here for two weeks. And then I wish in the grand scheme of things, what's one season, right? If you're trying to build a long-term program, it sucks for the kids. But yeah, you know, whatever the um, and so he will, which if they don't like it, they could transfer now. So actually, it really doesn't matter if they voluntarily chose to stay there if that they don't true. think he's a good coach. Um, that is true. And so I think Neil Brown will be fired like by the end of September. He will probably be the first casualty of next year, but he may turn I, it. I, think so. I don't know. I think so. I just don't see there's not a lot there to convince me that they're going to turn it around. Maybe they will, but I don't see it happening. Uh, BYU has some news this week. We didn't we didn't have a show last week, which is really uncharacteristic for us. It just sort of didn't happen. But there wasn't a show last week, so we didn't really get to talk much about uh, Jake Retzlaff, who signed officially this week. So really, it's topical because we're talking about it now. But we could have talked about it last week. We could have talked about it about a month ago. We could have talked about it a long time Did ago. Did he officially sign this week, or was it just announced this week? The world may never know. That's a good question. That is a great question. But he's here. He's part of the team now. Uh, Jake Retzlaff, man. I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see what he turns out to be. The The numbers are undeniable, right? I mean, he threw for 4,500-some-odd yards at Riverside City College. Um, he and he completed threw 63, it, 64 percent of his passes. He threw the it like year before it, times. Um, the year before he complete he, he played at a different school and completed had similar numbers. Like You're it was right. He 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 can sling it. Um, he's got kind of a funny throwing motion. And and somebody asked me this question of like, hey, is, are his weird mechanics going to come back to bite him? And like, one, I'm not a college football coach. I don't know. Two. Looking at it from my perspective, 
what would a mechanical flaw mean, right? Usually a mechanical flaw, you're going to see one area at least of the throw that lacks, right? Maybe he won't be quite as accurate as he should be. Maybe he won't be able to get it out as quickly as he should. Maybe he won't be able to get enough zip on the ball. All of those areas, he's able to to meet whatever you know threshold you would need to be a successful college quarterback, even though he's got kind of a funny throwing motion. So I don't know that, I don't know, I, I look at it like a sidearm pitcher. Like you're never going to train somebody to be a sidearm pitcher, but if you can pitch and you can do all of those things and you throw sidearm, then you're going to make it to the big leagues, right? right? Well, at some and, point, it doesn't matter. And at the college level, especially, like the, the speed of the game is so much different between the college level and the NFL, where it's like, yeah. look at look at Tim Tebow's release where it was like leading into the draft. It was like, he hired a private coach to like completely retrain his throwing motion, but urban Meyer thought it was fine. And he won two national titles, right? Like, so it doesn't the, the speed of the college game and how, unless you are playing Georgia's defense that you are going to be able to like, you know, that guys are just not slow for space. And then also the offensive design of the game and how heavy the air raid mm-hmm. concepts are where it's just everything is get the ball like one or two reads, get it out and you're done. It's the college game is so much more simplified and tempo based that your throwing motion doesn't really matter. Right. And, and they can fix it. I look at it and I don't see, I mean, maybe right. Like uh, again, I'm not a college coach, but I don't look at the, the the mechanics and the things that look a little bit funny and being like, whoa, that can't be fixed. So if it becomes a problem, I don't think it's a, you have to retool everything. I think it's a, right. a minor tweak. Um, Jake Retzlaff. So let's look at BYU's quarterback situation because now it's Jake Retzlaff plus Keaton Slovis, right? And we talked about it a few weeks ago um, before Drew, Drew Pine committed to Arizona State. And there have been rumors that have come out since that that whether you believe them or not, true or untrue, I think there's enough validity that it can be a discussion point. That that Drew Pine wanted to come to BYU and BYU said, eh, we, we, we like this Slovis kid. And as you look at that, like I think we all kind of scratched our heads a little bit to say, okay, I think Slovis might be the better guy in 2023, but with Drew Pine, you get two or three years worth of eligibility. Are you sure that that's not valuable? And it was really kind of a perplexing decision to not put some kind of substantial value on that extended years of eligibility. But now that there's that context of Jake Retzlaff, who BYU was trying to get all along, now that he's coming, it's like, oh, okay, this sort of makes sense now. He can play with Slovis for a year. You mean to tell me the guy that has put multiple back-to-back quarterbacks in the NFL and architected great offenses under multiple quarterbacks and also had Baylor frickin' Romney ready to ball out, knows what he's doing when it comes well, to he, managing his QB pipeline? He might have a plan. And so now you look at it, and it's no longer Drew Pine versus Keaton Slovis. It's Drew Pine versus Keaton Slovis and Jack Retzla- Jake Retzlaff. And I think if all goes well, right, all that Keaton Slovis has to do is stay healthy for eight games. If he can play eight games, then Retzlaff can preserve a red shirt, which he still has. He has three years to play two. He could preserve a red shirt this year, and then BYU has him for two years. And he could learn behind a guy who, regardless of what you think about Slovis, and I think he's going to be better than than the general BYU fan does. I, I don't think the they Slovis we saw— respect on his name. Yeah, I don't think the Slovis we saw at Pitt is Slovis. I think that was an indictment of Pitt's offense. I don't think that was an indictment on Slovis. I think— whether he gets back all the way to his USC form, maybe not, on, but I think Gary, he's going to be a lot closer. Come on. We need you. <laughs> get the, get the, the gang is back together. He's, he's, he's going to get closer to that USC form. But even if he doesn't, like Keaton Slovis is the kind of guy that, hey, we want his four years and multiple power five schools and different conferences. I'm a coach. That's the guy I want training my next quarterback, like showing him the ropes. And if, if all he's got to do, all he's got to do is stay healthy for eight games for Jake Retzlaff to preserve that red shirt and have two years to then try to lead BYU into the big 12 and 24 and 25, that starts to make a lot more sense of yeah. why Drew Pine would be told no. And I just really don't want people like worried about the, oh, well, you know, he has two years, like take the guy that has two years 
Keaton Slovis had two years when he went to Pitt and it didn't work out for whatever reason. Like you don't right. know until you know. You're taking yep. your best guess, especially a quarterback. And if it works out, there's you can get another guy next year. And if you get a multi-year guy, great. And that's honestly, this is to me, I would this, rather this get this is a, the new normal, man. If you can get a guy that is willing to sit, and obviously in California, the quality of Juco play on California has gone down, but still that is he's been getting reps. At a post call at a post high school level where the pace of play or the speed of the game is faster than uh, you know than what he was playing at in high school and continue to develop, that is worth something than taking a guy like ASU taking Jacob Conover, who hasn't played in a high school game since like 2017 or 2016, yeah. whatever. Um yeah. or 2018, I guess was a senior year. But the and so like is Retzlaff gonna be amazing? No, am I really comfortable with him as a recruit because I've seen him perform at a really high level against better than high school competition? Yes, absolutely. Is he going to be Bryce Young? I don't know, probably not. But can he be at least Baylor Romney? Yeah, definitely. And I'm comfortable with that, right? And so, yep. and if he's not the guy, and it's clear that he's not going to be able to go get the guy, you see him in practice this year, and you maybe he gets three games, and you see what he does. And then you go get another guy next and, year. That's fine. Like it's not like this not portal the guy, is a one year thing where right. the portal is closing and we can't get another guy next year. Well, and if he's not the guy, you don't have to give him that red shirt. And then you only have to invest two years in a guy on your roster who's not the guy. So right. I, I think this really works out. Uh the transfer portal, just a quick update as we kind of wrap up the show here. Slovis, I mean, Retzlaff is a Juco guy. Uh, I, I'm tired of, I don't like people calling these Juco guys transfers. I know that's technically what they are, but they're not coming out of the no. transfer portal. So let's not do that. So out of the transfer portal, BYU has added Keaton Slovis, Aiden Robbins, Waylon Lapuaho, uh, Ian Fitzgerald, who we haven't talked about yet on this show, uh, Jackson Cravens and Isaiah Bagna, six players. I think that there's six players who all will probably start. Ian Fitzgerald is the guy that people are looking at and saying, oh, that's a depth piece. I think he's a starter. I mean, he has started 26 consecutive games, 29 consecutive games at Missouri State. I don't care what level Missouri State he, plays. That's a lot of experience. Speaking of Bobby Petrino. Yeah. There you well, go. And, you know, he was blocking for, you know, Missouri State's quarterback was? No. Jason Shelley. Oh, he was the play. conference player of the year playing for uh, Bobby Petrino man, at Missouri me, State. He gives me nightmares still. Uh, right? The way that that 20, what was it? 28. We don't talk game. about that. Ooh. Don't talk about it. Um, so the, he, yeah, I don't think that he having started so many games, he is not going to come transfer unless he was told he was going to be competing for a starting spot, because even yeah. in his case, like he's not going to come. Yes. He wants to play for a big 12 school. That's great. But it's like from his perspective, if he's like just trying to get more tape, like he could have transferred and gone to Western Kentucky or UTSA, or like he could have gone to an American school Boise or state school. who offered him. Yeah. Right? He could have gone to a mountain West school. He could have gone to a G five program and continued to start right away so he is not going to turn down a starting job right for this you know for this and it's he he didn't his pff grade was not great but there were i mean he started 29 games and there were multiple fbs coaches who were like yeah we want a piece of that yeah so i i mean it's it's willing to wait and see and Lapu yeah. I don't think we, we haven't talked since he I mean, it's that's louis younger brother right uh cousin or cousin cousin um and you know, he started as a freshman at USU. He's got the frame. He's just, he's really raw, but he's like, he's got a nasty streak. Like he, he's the guy that he's going to miss blocks because pre-snap, he decided that he wanted to rip somebody, a certain guy's head off because of what he said after the play before. And so he's going to whiff something because he's out for schools. That's like, that is him. Yeah. And as a depth piece where he's the depth piece where it's like, yeah, he may not start this year, but he knows like, okay, I started as a freshman, just got home for my mission. At Utah State, yeah. If I read Did, for didn't go on a mission. I mean, he was right. He was an oh, eighteen-year-old oh, true freshman. He's an eighteen year year-old. Oh, so I totally yeah. I mixed some someone else. I thought he was a freshman. I thought he was a mission kid who's getting his legs back and everything. Then so true freshman starting at Utah State in a bad offense. He's got the the mean streak, and 
He's probably he's the kind of kid that he he's okay redshirting because he has three years ahead of him. I think he's he gonna the, start. I I and if he does he does, and if he doesn't, I, he's probably okay with it. But again, he's not. Right. He's gonna go where he knows he'll have a chance to start, whether yeah, he does I, or not. But Fitzgerald, where his clock is very limited, he's not going unless he knows he has has a starting job. He's yeah, not gonna I go agree. to see. I I think both of them end up starting. I think that that Waylon Lapuaho ultimately. Uh, it's a potential play and he's got a ton of potential. I I don't feel comfortable. You know, I wouldn't guarantee him the starting position next year, but I think he's going to go in and win it because he's got so much potential and he'll get better each week. And I think if you put him at left guard, right, stack him in between Kingsley and Connor pay to help, you know, call out assignments, get him in the right spot and make up for some of the deficiencies that a young player is going to have, I think Waylon Lapuaho is, it will find his way into that starting lineup. And I agree with you, Ian Fitzgerald. Um, so Fitzgerald yeah. does have, he does have two years to play because he redshirted in 2018 and then played four games, 2019 started the COVID year and then, Oh no, that his bio has not been updated. Yeah. He's one and done. That was yeah, 2021. Yeah. So he, yep. yeah, he's a one and done. He's not going to be a super C, super COVID senior to go ride the bench. No, he's I think he, gonna, I think he's gonna play. I think he's, he's gonna not gonna start. with the. He's not gonna go at, on the. At he's worst, not going for the Emmanuel Asupka. Yeah, transfer. At, at worst, Ian Fitzgerald is a depth piece. I, I think people who are talking about him as oh, that's nice for depth. I think that is the worst case scenario. I think realistically, he's a he's a starter at right tackle opposite of Kingsley Tuamataia. So it's King. So left to right, you think so? Kingsley's going to get moved. To I, I think move, Kingsley start up. yeah I think Kingsley and this is just pure speculation but I I would say well there's still Paul Miley who's out there right Paul Miley has has visited BYU he's talked about BYU everybody kind of knows that uh the the he was a former center at, at Utah for the last three or four years he's been the starting center um and he's had ups ups and downs but he's a very productive player for a team that went to back to back Rose Bowls that that that's a guy you want on your team right and so. There's a few situations or a few scenarios that this that, that this could ultimately end up being. So let's talk about the first one. Let's pretend that Paul Miley, who is supposedly going to announce his decision this weekend after he takes a last visit, let's assume he commits to BYU in this scenario. I think that Connor Pay is probably a better center than Paul Miley is right now. I also think that Connor Pay is probably a more capable guard than Paul Miley is right now. And I think the drop off from Connor Pay to Miley at guard is more significant than the drop off at center. So as as a result, I could see them moving Connor Pay, even though I think he's the better center, moving him over to guard. And then I would say something yeah. left to right looks like Kingsley, Lapuaho. Uh, Miley, Connor Pay, Ian Fitzgerald. Now, if we don't see Paul Miley commit to BYU this weekend, then I think you look at L- Lisala Tai as kind of your Harris Lachance, right? Harris Lachance played inside, he played outside, he was a big dude who could do everything. I think that's Lisala Tai next year. And so then I would plug in Tai for Miley, move Pay back to center, and then left to right, it looks like Kingsley, Lapuaho, Pay. Ty and Fitzgerald. That's my speculation on on what I think happens here. There's there's guys. So there's I, guys. I I'm really just like I am not worried about it. Like I think the offensive line is going to be fine. Mm-hmm. And I think they I mean, yes, we are losing three guys, right? We're losing Freeland and we are we're losing Freeland and Barrington, who we expected to be both we expected to be gone, and Tukuafu, who and, and Lachance we expected him to be gone. Yeah, and Lachance, who was the depth piece, right? And uh, but even then, like Tukuafu was a just fine guy. Like it was like Tukuafu was not he was never gonna be on a Big 12 all conference team next year. He right. was a ho hum, just fine guy. And right. so I, I'm fine. Like I am totally comfortable with the offensive line pieces going forward, especially if we add my life and the amount of starting. I care more. Like it's just when you're looking at transfers, it is just a completely different ball game. Different. Right? Like it is so different. You're looking at starting experience. Like you're looking at how they've actually played. Like they are a known quantity at that level versus, well, shoot, this kid played at a 3A high school 
in you know wisconsin what does yep. that mean you know it's just a totally different it's a totally different game um but so we have those and then defensively well aiden robbins we talked about love 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 continue to love aiden robbins he is going to be a great you know he's going to be a great piece next he's year a great fit in that offense he, he's a great man. fit in the offense and i'm you know i feel totally comfortable with him at running back and we still have um i feel comfortable with him and Am I making it up that somehow Lupini Katoa somehow magically had one more year? You are making that up, yeah. Okay, I'm just in a time machine and thinking of what he said after the bowl game in Birmingham last year, um, because yeah, he's finally done done. So the um, so I think you know so what we got next year we got Miles Davis, we got Aiden Robbins, and Hinkley Ropati. You know, that, mm-hmm. that's a fine running back. If there's nobody, it's fine. There's no yeah. NFL in there, but it, it's well, fine. I think Robbins could get there, but he, but he could, if he has a big season, but yeah, he's... but it, I don't know. I mean, I think you still got to go get a body and they're still recruiting LJ Martin, four star out of Texas. And if yeah, they if don't we, get uh, Martin, especially... there's, there's still tons of transfer portal guys out there. Yeah. The, it's, there's plenty of guys. And then defensively we got Jackson Cravens and was it Isaiah Bagna? Yeah, we both both following Kelly Papinga from Boise. Um, both of them can play. Both of them are probably going to start. Bagna has been really banged up, but he's got the body. He's got the raw. When talent. he's healthy, he's good, man. When he's healthy, he's good. He he walks in is probably me. He's immediately the most athletic linebacker we have. Uh, and Cravens is just Cravens is a good defensive lineman. He Cravens immediately pushes. Tyler Batty for the title of best defensive lineman that we have. We still need to get another defensive lineman. And that's a position where, uh, you know, well, I guess Oklahoma's that kid transferred to the kid from SUU who ended up porting went to Oklahoma state. Somehow the one guy they managed to pull who was good, right. <laughs> who was not walking out the building, but I'd like to go, even if we go to the FCS level and then there's still guys that are considering like what Eddie Heckard from Weber state, who was a multiple time FCS all American is in the portal probably a decent chance that he follows his coach to go play in the same system, but be in a beef play in the exact same playbook. He already knows, but have it be in a P five league instead of playing in the big sky. And so if we add a corner and one or two, hopefully defensive linemen, then, you know, it, it is just so much the, your ability to turn over a roster. Like look at TCU. They had a 12 guys from the portal last year and like nine of them were on the two deep and six of them were starting on six of their starters. I think on defense, they brought yeah. in from the portal. So yeah. You can, you can get guys like it's, you can get guys and it's not like your transfer of, well, we, who do we have right now that can step up? It's, it's a whole different ball game. So it's just not the, the game has changed with for better or worse, whether you like it or not, we're doing it different now than we used to. And it's, you know, it is the way it is. Um, but how do you feel with how we have played the portal this year? Um, I think that, I mean, people have been as aggressive as I think that they can be. I, I wish that they would have landed a few more guys, but I do think that I think BYU recognizes there's going to be like, it's not done next week. The transfer portal closes like the window for, for new entrance into the portal closes and then on the 18th. You still have everyone after spring ball, right? And, but Who's... there's still another window in May. And I think that BYU recognizes that there's going to be another wave or two after spring ball. So I still think we're going to see a handful of, of new additions. Maybe that happens in the next few weeks, but I think definitely if it doesn't, you're going to see it in May um, after spring ball. So, so what, I, is your, I like... what is your needs list right now? Oh, and a think, wide receiver. I think we need one wide receiver. I think they need a couple of corners. I, I would go two corners, and I would go probably two wide receivers. I am not high on the defensive line, but I think that the defensive line is serviceable enough. I am maybe putting too much credit, um, I guess too much blame on bad coaching of the defensive line. I, I think that they they need more talent but I also don't know how much more talent they need. I I would have to see spring ball, right? Because they were just so poorly coached along the defensive line. Maybe John Nelson and Tyler Batty and, you know, nice Amahe comes back. Maybe those guys look great with, with a real defensive line coach, you know, and a a better scheme. So the defensive line, I, I like the additions that they've made, but I also like that they haven't just gone all out yet because, 
they don't know what they've got currently because right. you got, you just throw the film out from the last year. Right. And so I think, and that's where we will see, especially in spring ball, although it kind of does, it, it's kind of interesting because with the, what you see of spring ball of like who is available, especially now with the free transfer of like, what is the batch of available guys going to be like, is it because all of the FCS guys who are, or G five guys who are like, I'm good. I'm trying to jump up there everyone who's probably worth getting has probably been in the portal. So what is the batch of guys going to look like where it's primarily, is there going to be a run for guys that are had a coaching change and they're playing in a new system and they're like, I don't like this guy. I don't feel like I fit in the system. I don't want to do this. So like, that's why I'm dipping out now, but I stayed before. And so I think that that's where it will be. Are you wearing a coach prime shirt for a Colorado coach prime shirt? I'm all in baby. Dude, I'm coming. I'll go for it. I'm um, coming. So I think uh, I think that is it'll be interesting to watch. But yeah, there'll be a whole slew of well, however many people under the portal is like two thousand kids entered. Yeah, or whatever. crazy. Th- there'll be another twelve hundred come May that throw their name in, and we can get those. What well, we need four pieces, maybe five. Yeah, we we can go get them. And even if it's just a depth piece of and BYU is going to have their own attrition after spring ball too. Like there's oh well, they're, we they're, they're not going to be immune to that. To that. Yeah. to get under 85 and it's although I, yeah most of the attrition that we have after spring ball will probably be voluntary or yeah. involuntary i mean i, I, I don't say. know about most but definitely a good chunk of it right like yeah. i i don't know who will leave yeah though, there may be some guys who are like dude i don't like sione poo is a jerk he actually makes me practice hard i like it when we didn't have to do anything <laughs> right you know, maybe, maybe there's some guys like that who knows Yep. Uh, are you watching this basketball game right now? I am not watching this basketball game. I mean, I'm breaking my streak of, well, no, I'm not. I'm continuing my streak of three years of not watching basketball games. Oh, well, we are up by one with 29 seconds left. So Whoa. It was like an eight point game with three minutes left. And then now we're kind of okay. You know, trying to, trying to not, not blow it and not choose screw play. that up. Well, I'll let you, let's get to it. Yeah. Go watch the last 20 seconds of the game. Yeah. This has been a good show, man. It has been a good show. It's, I think... it's different for people to see us. Like it's different. Look, for, it's, I know it's different. I kind of look like Frank, the tank. I don't need YouTube comments telling me that the, I understand. I, it is different in terms of us, like actually watching each other. This is the most FaceTime we've had because usually we're, we're go off and it's like, there's a screen in front and I flip back oh, yeah. and forth and I have to make it smaller and, you know, get, oh, get, yeah. It is very different where it's a little more studio vibe when we are both sitting up rather than like sometimes we're laying down, laying in bed, <laughs> right? laying in bed, holding a mic next to your phone. So it's trying to be a little more profesh, you know? Yeah, it's been good. So it has been good. We will get this over to Dusty somehow, get it up on the YouTube. And uh, I'll, just- I'll let you know. We'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Give him hell this week. Give him hell. <laughs>